In this section, we will discuss the primary methods of targeted protein degradation within cells. Proteasomes are distributed throughout the cell, detected in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus, and they can localize to hot spots in distinct intracellular regions or specific sites with high protein metabolism or with specific protein degradation requirements. The core particle of the 26S proteasome is shown here in yellow and red. Within the core, three different proteases, shown in different shades of red, are present and each have specific affinity for specific peptide sequences. To ensure the maximal breakdown of proteins that are targeted for degradation, ATP binds with the magenta regions of the proteasome and provides the needed energy to unfold proteins targeted for degradation and prepares them for cleavage in the peptidase containing core. The regulatory subunits shown in blue are responsible for the proteasome selectivity, ensuring that only proteins targeted for degradation are processed. In section 8.2, you learned about the ubiquitin post-translational modification, where the small peptide known as ubiquitin can be added to protein targets, altering their function. When proteins are polyubiquinated, or many ubiquitin peptides are covalently added to the protein, this can serve as a signal for degradation at the 26S proteasome. In this diagram, the protein being targeted for degradation is shown in blue. On the upper surface of the protein are several lysine residues marked in K. The two marked in orange are the ones that are covalently modified with ubiquitin. Additional ubiquitins are then formed, forming a polyubiquitinated structure that's shown in orange. The polyubiquitin structure is recognized by the proteasome regulatory domain, shown here in yellow, and protein unfolding and degradation ensues. Beginning with this degradation initiation site of the targeted protein that's shown in red, the ubiquitin peptides are released and recycled in the process rather than being degraded inside the proteasome. So how are ubiquitin peptides added to the proteins? Is this a selective process or are all intracellular proteins targeted equally? The process of protein ubiquitination requires the activity of three enzymes. The E1 class of enzymes, the ubiquitin activating enzyme, the E2 protein, the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, and the E3 ubiquitin ligase enzyme. Note that the E3 subunit is the one that actually binds with the target protein that's going to be degraded by the proteasome. So the E3 ligases are actually a family of enzymes. There's about 600 different E3 ligases that exist in mammalian systems based on bioinformatic data. E3 ligases recognize specific sequences in their target proteins and will only modify specific substrates with the ubiquitin tag. Thus, intracellular protein degradation is a highly complex and regulated system, similar to that of DNA transcriptional activation. Thus, it provides an elegant way for protein levels, and hence activity, to be post-translationally regulated. So it turns out that ubiquitin, labeled UB, is added onto target proteins using the C-terminal carboxylic acid functional group, which happens to be a glycine residue. The peptide is linked with the R-group amine from a lysine residue on the target protein that will end up being degraded. So this forms an amide bond linkage and looks strikingly similar to peptide bond formation that we've been studying all term, except that the amide bond is formed with an R-group amine rather than with a main chain amine functional group. So it turns out that amide formation in vivo is not as simple as the dehydration synthesis reaction that we have become familiar with. It is actually quite a bit more complicated. We will see this is true with peptide bond formation as well when we dive into the structure and function of the ribosome in a few chapters down the road. Within this reaction, 
The hydroxyl group on the carboxylic acid is not a good leaving group, and amide bond formation is usually energetically unfavorable if the hydroxide group has to be the leaving group. Thus, the carboxylic acid functional group needs to be coupled with another reaction and activated first. So in the ubiquitination system, the E1 activating enzyme serves this purpose and it uses a molecule of ATP in the process. So in the first part of the reaction, the E1 enzyme uses a molecule of ATP to form a ubiquitin adenylate intermediate. So anytime adenosine monophosphate, or AMP, is added onto another molecule, it's called an adenylate, right, for the adenosine group, and then changing it to the adenylate, makes it the backbone of the molecule, and then anything attached to it is like a functional group. And note it's linked through a phosphoester bond. In this process, the diphosphate from the ATP molecule is cleaved off, and it will be further hydrolyzed to release the inorganic phosphate molecules. So this hydrolysis reaction, releasing the two phosphate groups, releases a lot of energy. And this hydrolysis reaction then provides the energy to make this reaction energetically favorable in vivo. Once the adenylate is formed, a cysteine residue on the E1 enzyme can mediate nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon of the ubiquitin glycine residue and form an oxyanion intermediate. Notice that you are seeing a lot of oxyanion intermediates within enzyme reaction mechanisms. These are common. The AMP can then serve as a good leaving group when the electrons rebound into the molecule to reform the carbonyl group. So the AMP leaves and the E1 enzyme is left covalently linked to the ubiquitin through the formation of a thioester linkage with the active site cysteine residue. The E2 conjugating enzyme will then recognize the loaded E1 enzyme and mediate attack at the carbonyl carbon of the ubiquitin glycine residue. This also goes through an oxyanion intermediate as well and results in the E1 enzyme serving as the leaving group. This restores the E1 enzyme so that it can activate another molecule of ubiquitin for protein conjugation. And it loads the ubiquitin onto the E2 conjugating enzyme at a cysteine residue, forming this thioester intermediate. This diagram is just showing the E1 and E2 reactions a little bit more dynamically. Here is the pool of ubiquitins, shown in blue, together with a molecule of ATP, the ubiquitin is able to be covalently linked to the E1 enzyme through a thioester linkage. This is then transferred to the E2 conjugating enzyme. Once the E2 enzyme is covalently modified to carry the ubiquitin peptide, it can bind with an appropriate E3 ligase and its target protein substrate. Recall that the family of E3 ligases is quite large. Over 600 have been identified in mammalian genomes. Thus, different subfamilies of E3 ligases have different methodologies for binding with the loaded E2 conjugating enzyme and the target protein. For example, some E3 ligases have multiple subunits that are required for substrate binding. Furthermore, the most simplistic E3 ligases will mediate the direct transfer of the ubiquitin onto the target protein. Notice that the arrows on this diagram are just showing the movement of the ubiquitin to the other molecule. These aren't actually representing the electron movement during the chemical reaction. And so this is a little bit unfortunate, uh, chemically speaking. So you'll just have to remember that the nucleophile in this reaction happens to be the nitrogen. And so for this reaction, the nitrogen is going to attack the carbonyl carbon. It'll form that oxyanion intermediate. The electrons will rebound in. And in this case, the E2 protein will act as the leaving group. The ubiquitin will then become conjugated to the target protein at the lysine residue.
and form the amide bond. This will restore the E2 enzyme. Some E3 ligases are a little bit more complicated to this in that they have an active site cysteine residue that is going to first capture the ubiquitin molecule from the E2 conjugating enzyme. So the E3 ligase can also form a covalent linkage, or at least some of the E3 ligases can do this. They may form a covalent linkage first with the ubiquitin, freeing the E2 conjugating enzyme prior to linking the ubiquitin with the target protein. Again, these arrows are just showing the movement of the ubiquitin. This would all be nucleophilic attack mediated reactions on the carbonyl carbon of the glycine residue that's attached to the ubiquitin. That would happen first from the thiol of the cysteine and then from the nitrogen of the target protein. So there are many different ways that target proteins can be ubiquitinated. They could have a single ubiquitin group added and be monoubiquitinated, or several ubiquitins can be added onto the substrate. They can be added to different lysine residues. They can be added in a long chain. They can be added in branched fashions, and they can be added in heterologous fashion with the sumopeptide. So we also saw that the sumopeptide is a small protein addition that can also be made to target proteins. So you can see here that there's a heterologous branching with the ubiquitin peptide as well. These polyubiquinated products are often then targeted for degradation through the 26S proteasome that's shown here. The deubiquitinating enzymes, called dubs, recycle the ubiquitin peptides so that they can be reused in the process by the E1 enzyme. The target protein is then cleaved into small peptide fragments and free amino acids. In the next chapter, we will switch gears from learning about how enzymes work and how they're regulated to learning more about biosynthesis of DNA through the process of replication.